All right, let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12 today. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12, after listing several great examples of faith in the past, and those whose spiritual testimonies were above reproach, the writer begins chapter 12. Let's read the first three verses. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Verse 1 says, Seeing we also are compassed about. You know, the, uh, the legacy of faithful saints in the Old Testament lived beyond them. As similarly, the reputation of great believers in the New Testament church are there uh, to help encourage you as well, to keep you faithful to God. I am always impressed when I read a great quote by some Christian of years gone by, very encouraging, inspirational, even today. Um, William Carey, missionary in China in the 1840s, said, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. Why wouldn't any Christian want to live that way? Why wouldn't any Christian want to say, God, whatever you can do with me, whatever talents I may possess, they're yielded to you, and you help me to reach lost people for Christ, and minister to people as they need. But um, they're called a cloud of witnesses, and they're watching what you do, and cheering you along the way. They want you to succeed. They want you to succeed spiritually with Jesus Christ, to be successful without faltering one day and make it to the judgment seat of Christ uh, as a faithful believer and a faithful Christian. It's called a race, verse 1, but it's not a, a sprint. It's more like a marathon. That's why he says it requires patience. There. No believer can finish well by his own effort. So verse 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Without his help, you'll fail as a Christian. You can't do it on your own. Verse 2, who for the joy that was set before him. Look uh, forward at 1 Peter chapter 1 for a moment. 1 Peter 1, verse 11 there says, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified before of the, excuse me, beforehand, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. 1 Peter 2, and verse 23 But when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. And in verse 3, back here in this text, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary, excuse me, wearied, and faint in your minds. Christ endured the slander, and the taunts, and the charges, and the innuendo, and the mockings, and the accusations, and the false uh, uh, complaints against himself. He had his own future, and he had his own vindication in mind. So he put up with it. Uh, so verse 2 says, Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and therefore is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's uh, amazing how weak 
modern Christians are when it comes to living for Jesus Christ. How quickly they give up, how quickly they say, I, it's just too much, it's too difficult, I can't do it. Even though your parents did it, even though your grandparents did it in more trying circumstances, even though other Christians in other parts of the world have lived for Jesus Christ without compromising the doctrines of the scripture, what they were convicted about, and the blessings promised to them by Jesus Christ, modern Christians want to give up. And uh, they're afraid to let people know that they even are Christians many times. They don't want to scare away their new boyfriend or scare away their new girlfriend, so they don't talk about God at all. That's pathetic. That's pathetic. Uh, today's believers have no character. No Christian character. They actually have zero. None. And uh, living in a modern country like the United States, and I suspect South Korea is much the same way, and people who are believers there are just as weak in the flesh and will bend and yield uh, and not live for Jesus Christ any more than Christians here in the United States will. That's just the way human nature is. The more advantages and the more benefits, the more privileges people in the modern world enjoy, the less effort they're going to make to do something in the name of Jesus Christ, to talk to some lost person, to try and show someone something from the Bible that their friend had never thought of before, try to educate somebody about the scriptures. As I mentioned in our church hour, why is the Bible here? If it's not here for you to know and to stand, stand to and give an account for one day. But, you know, today believers, they have no character. Richard Wormbrand spent a total of 14 years in a Romanian, uh, being tortured in a Romanian prison camp for his faith in Jesus Christ. Without compromising, without giving up on the Lord Jesus Christ, without reneging and uh, taking back his testimony for Jesus Christ. Today's Christians, they won't offer a gospel tract because the person might make a face at me. They might say no. And they think that's persecution. It's not persecution at all. Um, some saved, unsaved politician puts up with a lot more abuse, a lot more accusation, a lot more innuendo, a lot more slander, a lot more gossip, a lot more negative stories uh, than today's Christians will. They, they've got a, a future political office in mind they want to win. So they'll put up with all those slings and arrows that come along uh, from side to side to knock them around because they've got their mind focused on something they want. And yet a Christian should be focused on winning the approval of Jesus Christ uh, without hesitation. And yet so very often um, they won't. They cave in too easily. But verse 4 says, You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. The implication is that Christ had resisted. I want you to run back to Luke chapter 22. Luke 22. Luke 22, notice there verse 44. It says, And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood, falling down to the ground. That happened in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was scourged, before he was crucified the next day. Christ's blood for sins was shed in his agony over the very prospect of having to die for sins. Was it possible to accomplish God's purpose without going to Calvary? The Bible says, he was in all points tempted like as we are, Hebrews 4.15. So the Lord Jesus said, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. I, we, you and I wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have to flinch or be surprised. A uh, human reaction to something like that. But it says in Luke 22, verse uh, 42, saying, Father, if thou be willing... Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, 
not my will, but thine be done. <clears throat> so he resigned to do the Father's will. Let's go on, verses 5 through 13. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If he endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with, as with sons. What, for what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if he be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards, and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits, and live? For they, our earthly fathers, verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he, God, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. It's not there. Verse 5, ye have forgotten the exhortation, which wouldn't have been hard to do because that exhortation was first found back in the book of Proverbs, chapter 3. And so he says that since uh, found long ago. He says, Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. Go back, if you will, to the book of Job. Job chapter 5. Job 5. And verses 17 and 18 there. Job 5. Verses 17 and 18. Behold, happy is the man whom God corrected. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. For he maketh sore and bindeth up, he woundeth, and his hands make whole. You know when God sends some personal problem to you, it may be very inconvenient, but it might be just sufficient to get your mind off the thing you've been obsessing with and back onto some spiritual concern. As I mentioned in our church hour, it's amazing how much time people spend worrying about things that don't matter. A hill of beans, the big picture, and it gets their mind off of spiritual things. You know, if the devil can get your attention off of your spiritual needs, off of your spiritual life and your spiritual growth by the scriptures, he's a He's achieved a great victory. He's accomplished a great deal. And you can't destroy your salvation if you're born again, but if he can become, make you ineffective and get your mind off your spiritual life with Jesus Christ and onto some other thing that might be interesting at, at first, but really is profitless. If he can get your mind off of that and get you distracted, then he's achieved a great victory. And sometimes Christians aren't mindful of it, and sometimes it takes God to throw some monkey wrench into plans and steer that person back to living for Jesus Christ and to buckle down and to say, you know what, this is more important. You need to learn the Bible. You're a new Christian. You've recently become a, a, a true believer. And now you've got some zeal. You've got some desire. You need to spend some time reading it and spend as much time as, as you can learning it. It'll be a great blessing to you because you never know when you might be able to use that information that knowledge to help some other person who's struggling, some other person who has questions. But uh, verse 6 in this text says, place it For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. That's Psalm 94. Psalm 94.
Psalm 94, verses 12 and 13. Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law, that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. Talked about deferred gratification last week. God wants Christians who are willing to be faithful, to live for him, to be patient with him, to bring their prayer requests and their deepest desires to him, put them in his court, trust him to answer, trust him to respond, trust him to bless, trust him to bring the necessary things that will bring joy and happiness to that Christian's life. Don't force it. Let God do it. I promise you, it may seem hard to live that way. In the end, you'll be more uh, satisfied, and God will bless you in some wonderful way if you're patient with Him and don't jump the gun. That's a problem with so many people. They want to force themselves into a marriage. They want to force themselves into a job. They want to force themselves into something that may not be where God wants them to be. It may not be with the man or the woman that God wants them to be with. It may not be uh, any number of places. Going to a, a church where the Word of God isn't taught, but, but the people are friendly and so forth. You're patient with God and say, my number one priority is to know the Word of God, to remain faithful to Him, to secure a testimony all the time, and not let anything knock me from side to side or, or affect it or cause it to waver or, or shift back and forth. I'm going to be faithful in not knowing that God's saved me. Maybe I've done some dumb things in the past, but God can redeem me, God can make me fruitful, God can make me a productive Christian once again, and I'm going to trust him to lead and direct and guide and give me wisdom along the way. I promise you, you will be much happier in years ahead, in years to come rather, than saying, well, I want to do this, I'm going to short, take a shortcut there and so forth, but uh, you won't be happy. And God won't bless it. Look at uh, verse 7. It says, If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth, chasteneth not? If you're not uh, a man's son or a daughter, then it's not his business to punish or correct you. Why should he care? You don't belong to him. But since you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father wants you to reflect well upon his own name and reflect well upon the person of Jesus Christ. I don't want to be an embarrassment to the Lord Jesus Christ with my life. I probably embarrassed my family many times, <laughs> probably embarrassed myself many times. Probably embarrass my boss. Probably embarrass the company I work for. Um, but I don't want to be an embarrassment to the, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ doing something that uh, a Christian with a clear conscience shouldn't have even done. It shouldn't even enter my mind to do. Draw a line in the sand and say, this is where I stop. I'm not going that far with that person. I'm not going that place with that person. That person is not saved. That person is not interested in the scripture. That person has no, no uh, interest or curiosity in learning the scripture. They, they don't want to know why I am a Christian. And I can't even get a wiggle room to uh, get the conversation started with them. Then, then drop them. They're of no profit to you. But... Uh, but since you belong to Jesus Christ, God wants you to amount to something. He wants you to represent Christ well. And like I say, I don't want to be an embarrassment to the name of the Lord Jesus or the name of God. And I doubt that you do either. Verse 8 says, But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, 
They are ye bastards and not sons. The Bible describes a child who never gets spanked as being a bastard. They're unruly, they're wild, undisciplined. Modern parents, modern child raising experts have sure made a mess of things. They really have. Um, don't give them time out. Life's too short to wait for the kid to cooperate. Spank them, spank them hard right now, and then they can have their time out. <laughs> That's the proper order. Uh, it'll be more effective, it'll teach them a lot more than simply time out, time out, I'm taking your toys away from you. There's a joke about the, the parents that sent their kid to, their, to his bedroom uh, as punishment, and then he goes to the bedroom, he's, the whole room's filled with toys, everything he ever wanted, that they've been buying for him. He's got every gadget and toy uh, that, they could, that he could name, they bought for him, it's in his bedroom. He's not being deprived of anything going to his room, he's actually being rewarded to go to his bedroom. But life's too short to worry that, about that. You know, um, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy, if you dare chase, uh, uh, thou therefore in your hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And uh, spanking builds character. When my brother and sister and I were kids, my dad would have to spank us. We got a lot of character in those days. <laughs> and you know something? Um, I look back, I've looked back over the years and I realized I probably deserved more than I ever got. Yes. <laughs> and, and I'm very thankful to, to the Lord that I didn't get more than I got. But what I got, I deserved every time. I can't look back on a single time and say, I was unjustly spanked by, by, by my dad. Every time I got it, I deserved it. Some stupid thing I said, some bad language I used against my brother, some fighting he and I would do. We had some great fights in the backyard too, my brother and I. <laughs> but, uh, but every time I got it, I deserved it. And you're not going to kill the kids spanking their backs. That's what the rear end's for. That's what the rear end is for. It's to absorb the the, the impact, the, the power, the force of a good spanking to teach them a lesson. Once the sting wears off, once the crying is over, once the, the, the pain is gone, um, then good things can result. Positive results can come. But the idea that uh, we're not going to spank them because it might hurt their feelings, who cares? Parent is in charge, not the kid. And I hope all of our families and our church members have that much good sense. Sometimes I remember when my son was young, boys seemed to need a little bit more firm um, abuse <laughs> than the girls do. And sometimes I could look at my daughters and yell at them and they'd break into tears. And that's all it, would, all it would take to straighten them out. But one time, I knew I had to spank my son. And I knew I had to spank him until he started to cry. I just kept spanking until, until the tears started. I knew then, then the message was being conveyed and it was going to be effective. If I had stopped short of that, it wouldn't have worked. But sometimes you have to do things that... You don't enjoy doing it. It wounds the father's heart, but it wounds the kid more if they don't receive it. And uh, mm -hmm. so someone who receives no discipline, no correction, God likens them to a bastard. They're wild. And uh, they've got no one to discipline them, no one to correct them and lead them, direct them as they ought to be directed. Um, like I said, life's too short to worry about time out. And then uh, you spank them first, and then give them the time out. If they can sit down, but um, in the great application, verses 9 through 10, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be subject unto the Father of spirits and live? For they, are earthly fathers, barely for a few days chasing us after their own pleasure. But he, our Heavenly Father, for our profit, 
that we may be partakers of his holiness. Jump forward again, 1 Peter chapter 1, a couple pages, 1 Peter 1, and start there at verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober in hope unto the end, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Run back, if you will, to the book of Leviticus, chapter 11. Leviticus 11. Leviticus 11, and uh, notice there verses 44 and 45. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and you shall be holy. For I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. If God is holy, he's completely separate from sin, he's undefiled, there's no corruption whatsoever with God, he's absolutely pure and separate from wickedness and uh, evil of every kind. Shouldn't that be a pattern? Shouldn't that be a model for every Christian to want to live like, to be like? I want to be as pure as I can be. For the Lord Jesus Christ. I say that, and it's much easier said than done. I'll grant you that. But that should be the objective, that should be the goal of every true believer. I want my life to count, to be pure, to be clean, to be virtuous, to be uh, respectful, to be uh, one that God can be proud of, that God can use, that God can say, listen, I can use that man, I can use that woman. They're, they're yielded to me. I can use their talents. I can use their zeal. I can use their interest in reaching the lost. I can use their interest, their hunger for the Bible, to do any number of great things for the cause of my son because they're yielded to me. I want my life to be like that seven days a week. The amazing thing about the life of a Christian is God holds out the ideal he holds out the ideal that every believer should try to emulate and be like. He doesn't always achieve it, doesn't always measure up to it. And actually, probably very seldom will ever measure up to it. But that should be his desire, that should be his goal. I want to make God proud of me, not be embarrassed by me. And so should you. Verse 11 in our text. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous, nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Afterward, excuse me, peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. After the spanking, after the crying, after the stinging goes away, then it becomes easier to comply. It becomes easier to obey, to behave yourself, because you've learned a lesson that I'm not going to get my way, I'm going to have to let God have his way. It much becomes much easier, the peaceable fruit of righteous, that is, uh, doing right from that time on. No, the word admonition means a gentle reproof, a firm reminder of what you ought to know or how you ought to be. To chasten or chastisement is to actually inflict pain, like a physical spanking, for the sake of some moral correction. Some moral correction. I'll never forget when I was in kindergarten. How old was I? Like five years old, I suppose. We went to a Christian school, and that Christian school had permission from the parents to discipline the kids. And I sassed back to my kindergarten teacher. Maybe I was first grade. 
kindergarten or first grade, and that teacher was a man. He dragged me down the hallway in the in the out of the classroom, went to the drinking fountain, made me take a big bite out of soap, and then rinse it out in the drinking fountain because I had bad, used bad language against him. And uh, that'll teach you to you know wash your mouth out with soap, like they used to say. I never forgot that. <laughs> I, never, <laughs> I never sassed back a, another school teacher from that time on. But it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness. I needed it. And um, so to chastise or chastisement is to actually inflict pain for the purpose of some moral improvement. And uh, a rebuke is a verbal uh, uh, reprimand. To ball somebody out, I mean, give them a good yelling out, yelling at, let them know what they did wrong and why they should be ashamed of themselves. Everybody else is ashamed of them, and they don't want to. You don't want to see it happen ever again. Some people need that. Some people need that. Some kids need that. Some grown-ups need that. We got a guy in our neighborhood. This is uh, the end of June. He'd been setting off fireworks every night for the last month. He starts around 9 o'clock at night, and, uh, you know, they have those signs, uh, fireworks are illegal in the city of Ontario, $1,000 fine. But he's probably doing it in his backyard, so I can't identify which house it's coming from, and you never know when it's going to go off, so you're not sure which direction to be looking in or, or listening to. But this goes on till about 10 o'clock every night. And he's been doing it every year for the last three or four years. It's sort of a tradition now. Um, he'll, he'll do this for about a month and a half, and then come 4th of July. Then the big show goes off. Of course, the police are never around to crack it. We you know when you're trying to go to sleep, or you're not feeling well, the last thing you want is some jerk, you know, setting off explosives uh, down the street from you, and you're not sure which house is doing it. And the police are never around to write citations. But he needs to be uh, corrected with the peaceable fruit of righteousness, <laughs> as it were. And, uh, or chastised. Maybe chastised would be a better way to deal with someone like that. And what I don't understand are the next door neighbors who don't call the police on him. You think they're living next door or they can't get any sleep. So he shuts off, he cut. He, Quits about 10 o'clock at night. Just when you think it's safe to go to bed, go to sleep, about 11.30, boom, there's more, you know. Midnight, boom, another 1, one o'clock in the morning. I woke up this morning at, uh, I get up early in the morning at 3.45 this morning, and I heard a couple going off. I mean, this, this all night long, <laughs> night after night. After. He's having a good time, but not everybody's enjoying it. All of those forms of discipline, all those forms of correction have their place. And he says there, verse um, 13, Make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. You want your life to be straight and well-ordered and set in such a way that there are no obstacles keeping you from living for Jesus Christ, keeping you from succeeding for the Lord Jesus Christ as a Christian, as a testimony for Jesus Christ. All of this section is fairly uh, self-explanatory. It didn't require a lot of detail. It's very Pauline. Uh, all of these things can be applied to a, a saint right now. It doesn't have to be restricted only to a Jew in the future tribulation or a Jew in the Old Testament. It can be applied to any believer right now, which is good. It's always easier to deal with a section like that. But verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. The words um, sanctify and holy are very closely related. When something has been separated from the group for a specific use, it's said to be sanctified. You sanctify when you separate it from everything else. Now that it's separated, now that it's sanctified, it is now declared to be holy. It's to be used only for the glory 
or the, the honor of Jesus Christ. It could be your life, could be your habits, could be your talents, could be your, your musical ability, could be your any number of things that you possess that can be yielded uh, to live for Jesus Christ, to bring honor to Jesus Christ in some way. Those things are now said to be they're sanctified once they're separated. Once they're separated, they are now declared to be holy. That's why I said those two terms are very, very closely tied to one another. And so should your life be. Once you get saved, God separates you from the unsaved, unbelieving world around you. And I'm so glad that he does. God does the saving. All you can do is the trusting. So he separates you from the world around you. Now that he's separated you, you are said to be holy. And with that in mind, he wants your life to be yielded to him in some way that will cause you to grow in your knowledge of God, that will cause you to have a deeper understanding of God and the revelation of the scriptures, that will cause you to be mindful of lost people and why they need to be born again too. As we got saved, why wouldn't you want someone else to get saved too? Um, he wants you to do with your life, those things which will reflect well upon him, which will reflect the best influences of his grace and mercy to you from that time until the day God calls you home. 